He drinks of the sand of the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to see you all here. It's nice to be here. I want to welcome everyone that's here. Uh, some folks online as well. Welcome you and welcome, of course, those of you sitting in here that I can see right now. Um, I had a comment I was going to mention at the end, but David led this song. Um, I listened to a different version of this song this morning. And Phil Wickham has a version of it, different lyrics. But there was something in there I just wanted to, to share with you when I was up here. But there's one little phrase he says that uh, when I fight, I will fight on my knees. I just thought that was relevant. You know, I see a lot of fighting. People aren't on their knees. You know, things are throwing in the air, right? But we need to be a people that when we fight, we fight on our knees. I was going to share that with you. Um, We've got some visitors here this morning. We're especially glad to see you. Uh, if you're a first time or second or third time, may not know we have an attended nursery back here at the back where these glass windows are. Feel free to use that. You'll have to give them some info, right? Because uh, you need to check in your child and we'll need to know a few things, but you're welcome to use that. That's attended back there. Um, if you've noticed, and I'm sure you have, because I have, but it seems like probably the last three weeks in a row. I, don't, I didn't count further back than that, but almost every week we've had one or two families that have noted, oh, we'd like to worship with you guys here. We'd like to place membership. And that's, that's been great. And uh, we have an event coming up. I'm gonna say much about it. There's some in the bulletin, you'll hear more. But for our new members for the last year or so, because of all the lack of gathering that we've had, We've got an event planned, so just you know, be watching your mail or phone call, and, and when that comes up and you get invited, um, how, how do I say this nicely? Uh, don't consider it optional, <laughs> okay? You know, Everything's optional, I get it. It's optional whether you wanna follow Christ or not, but you know, every, we got free will. But when you get invited, the shepherds would really like to spend some time with you. There'll be some food involved. We can sit around, visit, just get to know each other. That, that's the only point of it. So we hope that all of you that, that get invited to that, that have, have showed up in the last year or so, will be able to come, will plan to come. Uh, also, I was going to mention while I was on kind of new members, um, we, we do our best to get in, in each of your hands a form or maybe a conversation sometimes that says, where do you want to be involved here? Because we've got a, just a lot of things going on. Um, I'm not even going to try to list them. But if you haven't ever had that conversation with us, or if someone handed you the form that says, well, tell us what you would like to be interested in to, to be working with us here, be sure and just ask us. We'll be glad to, to get that to you. Uh, Lastly, still on my new member section in this little outline I'm trying to get through quickly. Uh, also, we've done a so-so job in acquainting our, our new members especially with our connect groups. And it's a thing you may or may not know about. You may have heard the word and from time to time and so forth. But at the top of this screen is a web address. If you're an online kind of person, you can just go to leanderconnectgroups.com. And the reason you'd want to do that is if you've placed membership here, 
or even if you haven't, you're just kind of visiting, trying to, you know, you might want to get to know us better. We certainly want to get to know you better. And this is how we do it. And there's other things going on with that as well. But on the next slide, when, when you click on this one, a map will come up. And you can click on some dots. Basically, these dots are the, where the leaders for different groups get, get you in contact with them. If you have questions or want to sign up or you have room for me kind of a thing. We encourage you to do that. Of just It's another way to plug in and, and we'd like to get to know you better. Also, you've noticed uh, there, our parking lot is less bumpy in several places. And it even looks nice and bright lines and so forth. Uh, some of the new letters on the parking lot say V-I-S-I-T-O-R on 10 spots out there, right? That's new. You may not have noticed it when you go and leave. See if it says that under your car this morning. But we picked some spots and they're right out here in front that we really wanted to reserve for visitors. Just make it easy when someone comes later, first time, how to find a spot. So I ask you to pay attention to those. So I said, I'll say it again. We're glad you're here. We're glad the Lord is here this morning. Let's join together as we worship him. Stand, please. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is the life my strength, my song. This Lord is alone, this solid ground. Burn to the fiercest ground.
you bow with me. Our dear loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in prayer. We thank you for being our gentle shepherd. Continue to lead us, Father. We thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with and that we're able to be here as a group with one purpose in mind, and that's to worship you. We thank you that we have this avenue of technology so that those who are unable to be here today can also be with us. Continue to bless each one of these that can't be here, but want to be here with us. We come to you today, Brother David leading us in song, we hope that these songs are coming to you as a beautiful melody to you. We're going to hear part of your word this morning. We pray that you will be the one delivering that message, that it may cause us to take something with us as we leave here today and share it with those who do not have Christ. We need Christ, we need him. He died for us, and we need to worship you, Father. Continue with us now in this worship service. We thank you for all that you do for us. You do so much for us. This is our prayer in Christ, our blessed Savior and Redeemer's name. Amen. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you each and every day. He'll never forsake you. Do not be afraid. He'll never forsake you. Courageous and do not be afraid. Don't be strong goes with you each and every day. The Lord goes for you with the trouble and try. And he
times we, we know the story of uh, Jesus there on the cross and we know the story uh, about uh, being able to uh, about uh, denying Jesus and hearing the rooster crow and I had one of those moments this week uh, where for a brief moment I was trying to decide I had a little video uh, conference thing going and uh, in the background was a little cross. And we had been warned before going to this conference about how we needed to be very sensitive to people and make sure to check what's in your background and all this. And it was worded in such a way that I kind of wondered for a little moment, should I keep that cross Beth, here in the background? And in that brief moment, I could swear I heard a rooster crow. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, I've got to keep that there. But it made me wonder, how many times do we hear the rooster crow in our lives? How many times have we done things where maybe we're not hearing it, but we should? We deny the power of Christ in so many ways in our lives, and we don't really intend to do that, right? We read that story and we say, we would never do that. And while we might not stand up here publicly and denounce the power of Christ. We do that a lot. We do that when we're trying to make a big decision. Maybe we're trying to make a decision about our career and we decide to worry about it rather than praying to God that he will take that decision from us, make it for us and guide us towards that. We deny him when we have activities that, that we, we put above everything else. We do that when we put the government ahead of the church. We do this in so many ways in our lives. And I don't know how many times the rooster has crowed in my life. There are times when I have sat there and wondered, God, what are you doing to me? Surely there's not a God? And I hear that rooster crow. Now remember that he is in charge. Whether we understand him or not, he works in so many mysterious ways. And he, he, he can take everything that's bad and make it right. And make things right with our hearts. And he died for us even though we deny him. Perhaps on a daily basis, perhaps a weekly basis. Because he loves us. And so Jesus took the cup, um, took the bread, and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and said, drink this. It represents the blood of my body poured out for you. And we need to take that seriously because that is a reminder of our baptism. That's a reminder of the power that he should have in our lives that we too often deny. Let's pray. Father, 
This time we come to you to remember your awesome power. To remember the power that saves, the power that washes us clean, the, the power that takes our sin away, the power that makes our heart clean in your presence, Lord. We pray that as we take this bread, that we'll remember your body hanging on the cross, broken open for us, hurting, suffering, to take away that sin. In your name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you again as we continue to remember your sacrifice for us. Remembering the blood that flowed out of your body that cleanses us of our sin, Lord. Takes away those things in our lives that we think we can't overcome. Washes us clean, makes us whole, Lord. Thank you, Father. There's nothing we can ever do to make up for that, for, to, to, to thank you enough for that sacrifice. In your name we pray, amen. There are many ways that uh, we give uh, back to uh, the church uh, through our service uh, and through our gifts and uh, through our prayers. And this time uh, we uh, 
do want to bring your attention to uh, being able to give of, of, of your money, the things that uh, that's part of what God blesses us with. And he doesn't ask you to give uh, any specific amount. It's what you believe you uh, you owe him back, so to speak. He, he has blessed you with so much, I'm, I'm really stepping on my words here. He's blessed us so much, and he asked for so little in return. And he can take what little we have and do amazing things with it. Is that a little better? <laughs> uh, we do allow you to uh, be able to give online. We do have plates in the back as well. And uh, our elders are uh, very good about making sure that the money here is spent wisely. And uh, if you look around, there's nothing very, like, uh, fantastically beautiful in here, right? I mean, no offense to the way this all is, right? But this isn't some fancy cathedral or something like that. They're, they're, they're very good uh, shepherds with our money. And so at this time, I think I'll shut up before I dig my grave a little deeper here <laughs> and pray. <laughs> Father, uh, we come to you this time to thank you for all that you give us and to allow time for us to give back to you, Lord. And we pray that everything that we do, everything that we give, will be used to glorify you, Lord, and to be able to spread your love and to be able to let your light shine from this congregation. Lord, we thank you for everything that you do, and we pray that we continue to do your work. In your name we pray, amen. All right, at this time, it's time for the children to have a chance to go to their own children's Bible hour. We're over here to second grade, so we're going to sing them out with this little light of mine. That's all we stand here. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine, oh yeah. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of Yeah. 
Jesus was walking beside the Gal Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Donovan. Don't you love it when I give you a scripture that has words like Zebedee in there and different things like that? That's <laughs> hey, you did a great job, Donovan. Thank you for doing that, man. Um, I'll tell you what, go ahead and open up your Bibles. Listen, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture this morning. Uh, so get your, your Bibles out and ready. Uh, there's a lot of text that we're going to look at. We're going to jump around to a few different places to try to make uh, the point that I would like to make this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1 here in just a bit. Luke chapter 5. Uh, but I was looking through some of my material uh, by the way, at the end of the, the last Sunday in October is going to be our Missions Sunday. And so that's just something to be prayerful about and to be thinking about. Last year at this time, for those who don't know, each year we do uh, what we call Mission Sunday. And it's a Sunday where all uh, things given through this special contribution go to support our missionaries. Uh, and we support many of those. And we're going to be telling you about who we support, the works that we are involved in here at Leander. Uh, we're not just 
what you see with your own eyes here in our building. The ministries we have, the things we do, yes, we believe in them, we're proud of them, but we are involved in so much more beyond this property. And that's what Mission Sunday's all about. And so be praying about that and thinking about that. Uh, last year, uh, we had set a goal, and I believe we... we outshot that goal, and I don't know this, the stats, I don't have the numbers with me, but we outshot that goal. You overgave the budget that we had, and so we were able to add new things to support. And, and we did that, folks. You were able to give in the midst of a pandemic when a lot were affected financially, and our country was is, is hurting economically, and yet God used us to give even more than what we asked. And that's amazing, and that's what God does, isn't it? That's just who he is, and that's what he does. And so we're praying for this Mission Sunday as well. So uh, I've been thinking about, well, what would I like to preach leading up to Mission Sunday? And I was looking through some of the material, just some of the lessons I had preached in, since I had been here, and I saw this lesson. And so I, I looked at the date of this lesson. When did I preach this here? And I realized that I preached this lesson in February over two years ago. And I realized that that was when, if you remember, if you've been here since I've been here, you remember that was when I was still traveling and I would come down here and preach on Sunday and then I would travel back to Louisiana and I would live with Avery there in Louisiana and then I would drive all the way back next Sunday and I'd preach again and I did that all through the month of February. So this is one of the first sermons I ever preached at Leander. And so it's very special. Um, and so I remembered as I was looking at this, I said, oh no, I forgot. This is, what I wanted to do with this lesson was it was something I planned to preach again about a year later because it's kind of one of those lessons that's timeless, right? The application of this is something that you don't just want to hit once. It's something we need to look at again and again. And... So it was over two years ago. I wanted to preach it, so apparently I should have done that last year, but something called COVID kind of uh, rocked our world, right? And things got hectic, and suddenly I was preaching online, and I'd never done that before. And so uh, here we are. I'm a year late, but I've pulled it back out. And, uh, and so I think it's a great opportunity to us, uh, for us to reflect this morning. This is a lesson of what I call a where are you lesson, okay? It, it is a... Uh, uh, a map lesson. Paul would call it a depth of insight lesson. You remember in Philippians, he talks about having the depth of insight. It's an introspective lesson. It's a lesson. The whole goal of my lesson this morning is for you to walk out of here knowing where you are spiritually. And if you can't find that this morning during the lesson, I hope that it at least gives you the motivation to say, I need to do some introspective stuff. That depth of insight. So I call it a map lesson. Right, because maps are awesome. How many of you use Google Maps to get around? How many of you would be absolutely lost if your phone died and you didn't have Google Maps to get around? And the rest of you are liars, right? No, I'm kidding. Some of you, you do have a good sense of direction. I was not blessed with that. I would be absolutely lost without Google Maps. But what makes a map valuable is the one part that's on the map and it's highlighted usually in red, right? And there's a little, little three word phrase above it that says, you are here. And if I can't find where I'm at on the map, it might have a lot of directions and a lot of places I wish I could go, but I'll never be able to get there because I don't know where I'm at. This is a map lesson. And hopefully by the end of today, there'll be a beacon on your spiritual radar that says, you are here. And that's the win. The rest of the lessons that I preach typically help us to try to get to where we want to go. We have a vision statement, right? And this is the Leander Church of Christ seeks to be a people shaped into the image of Jesus Christ by doing all of these different things. And so this is a great vision. But here's the thing with the vision. The vision doesn't tell you where you're at. The vision says, this is where I'm going. So before you can take steps towards who you want to be, you first have to identify who you are. And that's what this lesson is about. And so I've titled this lesson two years ago, Follow Me. Everybody say that. Me. Let me ask you something. You don't have to answer right now, but just think about this. Is following Jesus easy? 
<laughs> okay, you did answer, right? It, it's, it's pretty simple. Following Jesus is not easy, but there's this thing out in the world that you'll hear. And you've, you've encountered it before, whether or not you knew the title of it, but it's called the Prosperity Gospel. Everybody say Prosperity Gospel. You need to be familiar with this. I've preached on this before, but you might not remember. The prosperity gospel is leading thousands of Christians astray. And the problem with the prosperity gospel is this. It sounds awesome, right? And it is up front. And it will get a lot of people to follow Jesus quickly. But it won't keep most of them there over the long term, right? And Jesus doesn't say to follow me once, Right? He says, follow me. And he says, you're to pick up your cross and follow me. And, and how often? Pick up your cross when? Daily, every day. This is a daily journey. But here's what the prosperity gospel is. The prosperity gospel is this idea that following Jesus will get you a bunch of stuff. Right? Following Jesus will, will get you a bunch of money. Right? Hey, John is here this morning. John's my buddy. I'm calling him out from Sunset. John, wave your hand so everybody can see you. Yeah, there's John back there. He was my roommate in preaching school. And so he's, he and I got to hang out this weekend and do some cool stuff together. And so anyway, so John's here this morning. You remember the guy that we studied with when we were at Sunset? We met him at the 7-Eleven gas station across the school named Brian. And, and John and I, of course, we're just babes, right? Like we don't understand anything, you know, and we were just so excited. We're, we're like, hey, let's go to the preaching school. We're going to be preachers. And we didn't know anything, you know. We hadn't taken many classes. And all of a sudden, we see this guy at the 7-Eleven gas station named Brian and we start talking to him and a lot of the students would go there so he saw these preaching students every day and, and we'd all go and get snacks from the gas station you know John and I would always get gummy bears and, and a monster energy drink don't judge us uh, I've grown out of that okay but that's where we were at that point in our life um, and, and so we would go and we would get our gummy bears and we get our drinks you know and, and check out and he would always say you know oh y'all from the school and we talk and finally we set up a bible study with this guy and it was, it was going really well, and we talked to him. And, and finally, after you know, a lot of times where we would go and we'd study with him, there was the one time where he said, um, he said, Nathan, John, I, I see that I, I need to be baptized. I see that I need to do these things, and that's, that's, that's what I want to do. But I just want to know when we're going to get to the money part. You remember that? He said, I just want to know when we're, so I've got proof this morning since John's here. I just want to know when we're going to get to the money part. And John and I kind of looked at each other. It's kind of one of those things where you make eye contact and you, you want to laugh, but you don't. And you're kind of like, what? And he said, no, I know. It's somewhere in here. He started flipping through the Bible. And he's flipping through these pages. He says, I know it's in here somewhere. I'm just not sure where it's at. But I know that following Jesus will get you rich. And he said, I really need some money. And, and he did. His life, he, he didn't have a lot of money. Somebody had told him and had put this idea in his head through the way that they presented the gospel that if you follow Jesus, you'll get a bunch of stuff. And he really believed that. And so rather than being able to just teach this guy about Jesus, we now had to go back and backtrack and say, that's not what following Jesus means. And that crushed his spirit because he had this unrealistic vision of what it is to follow Jesus. But Jesus tells us, when you follow me, if you want to seek to be a people shaped into my image, it's going to be painful. In fact, he says, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. So I've got my cross and I'm following Jesus. And when Jesus said that, where was he going? To the cross. He was going to die. And he says, you've got to die every day. Does that sound easy? Does that sound like you're just going to get a bunch of stuff here on this earth? Now, listen, there's a lot of blessings in following Jesus, but it's not the blessings of financial gain and things of this world, right? It's much better than that, but it takes us a long time to understand that. And the prosperity gospel is sick, and it's leading so many people astray, right? Because let me ask you this, has your journey of following Jesus been quick and easy? Was it something that, that you just woke up one morning and you were spiritually mature? 
You know, and, 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 and now you, I know you've arrived at the place you want to be, and so spiritual growth, that's a thing of the past, right? No, 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 it's a constant journey of ups and downs. And if it's like me, it's a, a lot of times it's like three steps forward. You heard the old phrase, three steps forward? Two steps, back. Two steps back. You know, mine's usually three steps forward, four steps back, five steps forward, eight steps back, nine steps forward, right? Like it's just an ever-moving thing. That's what faith is. So when Jesus says, follow me, there's a lot that's there. And that's why one of my favorite people in Scripture is Peter. Because, listen, he's the most relatable. No matter where you are or where you've been, Peter was there. And he was there in three years. Right? We get to see this three-year snippet in the Gospels of Peter. Of course, there's more with Peter we get to see also. But if you just look at his journey in the Gospels, wherever you're at this morning, you know, you're looking at your map, you're trying to say, here I am, Peter was there. And so if you can't relate with Peter this morning, then you're not human because he was there. And so I want us to look at Peter and he's going to teach us about this journey of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And it's not this prosperity gospel that you've heard about. It's something totally different. Luke chapter 5 and starting in verse 1. This is the beginning of Peter and his journey. And so one day Jesus is standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and they're listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. They're done fishing. They're washing their nets. And so he gets into one of the boats, and it belonged to Simon. And there, uh, or, and he asked him to put out the boat a little from the shore, and he sits down in this boat, and he teaches people from the boat. It's a cool scene. And when Jesus is done speaking, he looks to Peter, and he says, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon looks at him, and he says, Master, We've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught a thing. And if you've ever gone fishing and not caught a thing, it's one of the most depressing things in the world. And you're sore, and you're miserable, and you're tired, right? And Eric, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Right? This relates, right? He's a big old fisherman over here. So uh, next time I'm... By the way, you've got to take me fishing sometime. All right? I'm just going to set that up from the pool pit. What, right, here, right here with all these witnesses. Okay, all right. So I love fishing. I'm not any good at it, so you've got to teach me because this is my story every single time. So show me how to catch some. But I relate with Peter here. Hadn't caught anything all night. But he says, but because you say so, we'll do it. And so when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets start to break. And so they signaled, that's what I want, Eric, I want my nets to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that the boats started to sink. I don't want that many. <laughs> and when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were so astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so James and John, the sons of Demony, and Simon's partner. So, so Peter falls down. He sees this miracle happen. And he looks at Jesus. And his response was to look at himself. Jesus is standing right in front of him. But he's got to put his eyes on himself. And what is he saying? I'm not worthy to even be around you. Get away from me. I relate so much because Jesus is standing there and I know all he wants is for us to see him and to look at him, to worship him, to focus on him. But so often I'm just like Peter and the one thing I want to do is look down at my own navel and say, I'm not worthy to even be around you. Get away from me, right? But Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. And so they pulled their boats up to shore and they left Everything, and this is a powerful phrase, and followed him. Everyone say, followed him. Followed. And, and, and they left everything. Not prosperity gospel, I get stuff, but when I choose to follow Jesus, I lose and sacrifice everything but him. Jesus becomes my all. And so Peter begins 
to follow. But even though Peter starts well, he's got these bumps along the road. You know what I'm saying? Like he just, he started off strong and he left everything to follow him. But if you follow Peter's journey, you see all these different bumps. Let's look at one of them in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and starting in verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. And and, and (laughs) Peter starts well, and he's always got good intentions, and he's got a good heart, but he just can't help but open his mouth when he should have kept it shut, right? I don't relate with that, though. I would never. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he's got to go to Jerusalem and Jesus is going to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he's going to be killed and on the third day raised to life. Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for what's going to happen. He just plainly tells them, this is what's going to happen. And of course, they miss it, right? They still don't understand. But Peter, Peter's listening to this thing. And Jesus, the one that he left everything to follow, is saying, I'm about to go die. And Peter says, wait a second, right? He's got to open his mouth because he's Peter. And so of all people, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. I love it. Right? Can't you? Don't don't you just feel it? Peter just can't. He's so impulsive. He's so impulsive. Right? Not like me. I'm not that way. I know you're not. No one in here is like that. But Peter, oh, he's like that. And, and, and so Jesus says something, and he says, wait a second. Jesus, come here. Come here. I got I to gotta tell you. One-on-one real quick. Hang, hang on, other guys. Hang on a second. Jesus and I are going to have a little powwow over here. Jesus, what do you think you're saying, man? You're crazy. Right? And Peter wants to tell Jesus what to do. And Jesus, listen to his response. Peter takes him aside and he says, verse 22, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And the reason he says this is because Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He doesn't want to. Right? Right? Jesus didn't want to. He prayed a whole prayer that night looking to the Lord and saying, let this cup pass from me. If there, now, if there's no other way, we'll still do this thing. But, but Jesus is saying, please, let it, let it pass from me. And so Peter, this is a temptation when Peter says, no, you don't have to do this. That's a temptation because Jesus could easily say, oh, you're right, there can be another way. But Jesus knows I have to do this. This is what God has called me to. And when God has called you, you can't let anything get in your way. And so he says, Satan, get behind me. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus turns to the rest of the disciples. So he just stops this powwow and he turns to everybody else. And so he he just, Peter took him aside to rebuke him and Jesus rebukes him, right? And then he turns to everybody else and he says... Verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, right? Why does he say this? Because Peter's trying to direct Jesus to tell him what to do. He's trying to direct Jesus, but Jesus is telling him, your job's not to direct me, your job is to follow me. That's what you're supposed to do, follow me. And so... Peter, with good intentions, makes this mistake. And, 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 but Peter, he's got good intentions, but he just, <laughs> he's impulsive. He wants to follow Jesus. He loves Jesus. He would follow him to the ends of the earth. And then he makes this huge commitment. Listen to this, Matthew 26 and verse 31. I'm going to start reading quickly. Matthew 26 and verse 31. Then Jesus tells these disciples, again, this very night, you're all going to fall away on account of me, for it's written. Then he quotes this prophecy. And in verse 32, he says, But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter says, Whoa, wait a second. Verse 33. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. 
Like all these other dudes, they may reject you and they may fall away, but I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'll never fall away. And Jesus turns to Peter again and says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter declares, and he says, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, and he gets specific now, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. You know, John, we were sitting in class one day. I don't remember whose class it was, uh, but I, I'll never forget it, and you probably remember it too. One of our instructors at Sunset years and years ago was teaching a class, and he said, you're never above any sin. Don't ever put yourself above any sin because pride comes before the downfall. And he said, we had this, this very faithful instructor, and, and I don't know who it was, he didn't give the name, uh, but he said, this guy was teaching a class on marriage and family and, and, and that kind of a thing. And he was a very faithful man. And, and he had taught for years in this preaching school and had trained other preachers to be preachers, and so he's very faithful. And this guy stood before his class and genuinely, probably with the, the best of intentions, just like Peter, says this statement. You know, I just can't understand how anyone could ever cheat on their wife. It just doesn't, I, I, I don't mean any offense or anything, but it, I just can't comprehend that. It's just so far, it's not even a temptation for me. And I have other temptations, but that is not a temptation. And then our instructor who was telling us the story said it wasn't a year later when he left his whole family, kids, and his wife for another woman. And they had to get him out of the preaching school and it was just a mess. It was such a mess is what he ended up saying. And, and, and that, don't, don't you see that with Peter right here? I mean, he's got good intentions, but he sets himself up and he says, I could never disown you. I would never do so. Have you ever told God something like that before? You know, I do this all the time and I, I try to watch it now, right? But Because it, it's like saying sick him to a dog. You know what I'm saying? It's like telling Satan, hey, come after me. And Satan's really good at what he does. And so he'll come and he'll come full force. And so don't, don't, don't say these kinds of statements. I would never do something like that. You know, I, I, I usually say it like this. God, if you just help me out right now, I promise I'll never miss another church service. <laughs> you know, I promise I will never X, Y, or Z. And we make these promises we can't live up to, and that's exactly what Peter's doing. Uh, John chapter 13, let's keep this moving. I promise this is gonna head to a, a place. I'm going to land this plane. John chapter 13, Peter suddenly hears some terrible news from Jesus. Jesus has told him in this context now, the night before the cross, he says, I'm about to go somewhere where you guys can't come. He's talking to his disciples. I'm going to go somewhere you can't come. And then verse 36 of John chapter 13, Simon Peter asked Jesus, Lord, where are are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now. But you will follow later. And that news, Jesus saying you can't follow, has to break Peter's heart. Because Peter, three years ago, left everything to follow Jesus. He left his job. He laid down his fishing nets. He left everything behind and fully dedicated himself to following Jesus. And it hasn't been a perfect journey. And I think Peter would admit that. But he's been close. He's been so close to Jesus for so long. And Jesus says, you can't follow me where I'm going next. You'll follow later. I think this is a dual fulfillment prophecy because he's clearly talking about heaven. I'm going to go and you can't follow me, but you'll follow me later. Right? But he's also, I think, talking about what's going to take place that night. I think both are true. And I'll show you what I mean. That's my boy. He says, Dad, get to the point. Matthew chapter 26. <laughs> Matthew 26. 
I want you to see something. By the way, if, if you look at P this moment, we're heading to Peter's denial. And if you look at this moment, a lot of times I just go, Peter, that was just so foolish, right? If, if I were to say, what, what comes to your mind when I say Peter, all of you would have gone, his denial, right? I mean, that's the big thing with Peter. That's the big thing. Maybe the day of Pentecost because there's some other good ones too. But, but I don't know. For me, my mind just goes to Peter's denial. And, and I always go, that was his biggest mistake, right? This was his lowest moment. But after I've studied this and looked at this, I don't think so. There's a moment that happens before his denial where, where Peter hits his lowest. And his denial is not his biggest mistake. This is. Look at verse 57, Matthew 26. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But listen to this. But Peter followed him. Like he's always done these past three years. He's been so close to Jesus. I mean, I mean, he wasn't perfect and there were bumps in the road, but man, he loved Jesus. Can't you see that? Can't you feel that? I mean, his heart was ripped out of him when Jesus said, you can't follow me. He says, no, I'll follow you. I'll die first. I'll do anything. Let me stay with you, Jesus. I just want to be with you, right? And, and, and now he says, Peter followed him. How? At a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest and when he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome and for the first time in Peter's life he's following Jesus but he's following him at a distance far away he wants to see what's up with this situation I want to see Jesus, but I'm not ready to fully commit to being in with Jesus, right? Because being in with Jesus means not prosperity gospel, but it means I'm going to have to suffer and it's going to hurt. And so I want to follow you, but I don't want to follow too closely. I want to follow away. I want to follow at a distance. And that is what I'm saying is Peter's biggest mistake. Because that distance between him and Jesus is then what leads to the behavioral problem. The distance between Peter and Jesus is not just a physical distance, right? It's an emotional and spiritual distancing that Peter takes place of, and you can't see it. And, and, but that's what leads to the behavior problems in our lives. The thing that we can't see is why I'm addicted to this or struggling with this or falling into this sin over and over again. The reason that my marriage is not the way it should be. The reason I'm not the dad that I want to be. The reason that I struggle in my job. The, the reason that I struggle to be a good person. The reason that I'm struggling, the behavior stuff in my life. If you stop and take a look and identify where you are and if you see that you have distanced yourself from Jesus, from your children, church family, from those who have faith with you, when my relationships are not as strong as they have been, when I'm following Jesus, I've got a good heart and I love him, but I'm f and I'm following him, but I'm following him from a distance. And when we distance ourselves from him, we set ourselves up for failure. And that was Peter's biggest mistake. And then it leads to Peter's denial in Matthew 26. Uh, it starts in verse 69. And, and, and Peter is sitting in the courtyard and the servant girl came to him and she says, you are also with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about. Notice the progression in his lie, by the way. Anybody ever struggle with this? It starts off and you tell a little lie and then it grows and grows. You remember the Veggie Tales deal with the fib, you know? They, they personify a fib and he grows and he grows and he grows. Anyway, that's what this is. Verse 70, he denies it. Verse 71, he goes out to the gateway. He sees another girl. And uh, he said to the people there, she, or she said, this, is, this guy was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72, he denies it again. This time, listen, with an oath. Right? First time I just denied it. This time I deny it with an oath. Right? And, and this oath is not like cursing or swearing. This oath is like... Uh, I put my hand on the Bible and I will swear in front of you all. I will make an oath that I do not know him. I promise you, I don't know what you're talking about, right? But then a, a little while later, those standing went up to Peter and they said, surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to curse. <laughs> then he opens up his, his sailor's mouth, right? He, he, he pulls back and reverts back to his fisherman days, 
Right? For three years, his language has been cleaned up, his life has been cleaned up, but now he's distanced himself from Jesus and instantly isn't it interesting that he reverts right back to who he used to be in a moment of pain and fear because of the distance in his relationship with the Lord. And so then he starts to curse on himself and he swore to them all I don't know this man now uh, I'm, I'm glad that Matthew kind of cleaned it up for us because he says all Peter said was I don't know this man but that's not all Peter said there was a lot of other things being said that shouldn't have been said right and then immediately a rooster crowed and then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. And then he goes out and he weeps bitterly. And in Luke's account, I love it, Luke twenty two sixty one. Luke says, the Lord turned and he looked, not just looked at Peter, he looked straight at Peter, the text says. And then Peter remembered. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. And I used to think that that was a look of, I mean, if I were to ask you, what do you think Jesus was looking like? What was that look? A lot of you'd be like, it's that kind of, I told you so, right? And, or, or a look of anger. Come on. But then as I, 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 I've thought this through and, and studied more, I've come to a place, my, my next step on this journey was I thought it was a look of disappointment. What was worse when your parents said, I'm so mad at you, you're getting a spanking when you get home or whatever. I, I don't know if y'all believe in spankings. Uh, I believe in spankings and I got a lot of them, Right? And needed a lot of them. And, and the problem is I can't get my dad to stop it still, right? <laughs> and so I thought, you know what? What's worse though is when he says something like that or when my dad would look at me and he would say, son, I'm not mad. I'm just so disappointed. Ooh. <laughs> right? It was deeper. And I thought... For a long time, I thought that's what Jesus was looking like. But the more I study this, the more I really believe that Jesus' look was not a look of anger and it wasn't a look of disappointment. Jesus knew that Peter's at his rock bottom in this moment. Jesus knew that Peter's been distanced from him. This moment did not surprise Jesus. Jesus did not need an I told you so. Jesus told him so a long time ago. Jesus didn't need to be vindicated. There was nothing in the look that was about Jesus. Jesus looked at Peter full of love and full of grace and full of forgiveness I think Jesus had tears in his eyes not for himself I think Jesus had tears in his eyes for Peter wanting to say but could not say because Jesus is going through what Jesus is going through and there is now a distance between him and Peter but he can look in his direction and the look says I love you don't let this beat you come back to me I'm still here but Peter doesn't see that in that moment. All he sees is himself. He's looking back at his own navel again, right? And he says, I'm, he goes back again. He reverts back to where he was. When Jesus showed up when he was fishing right at the beginning. And Peter's first response was what? I'm not worthy to be around you. And again, he looks at him and he says, I'm not worthy to be around you. And Peter leaves. And what happens in John 21, we're not, we don't have time to read this text, but what happens is amazing. Peter says probably the most sad and heart-wrenching statement in all of Scripture. I don't underline or highlight in my Bible. I'm just not that kind of a guy. Right? I do notes off on other things, but there is one verse in all of my Scripture that I have highlighted, and it's John 21 and verse 3. John 21 and verse 3. And here is what it says. It would be a weird one to highlight if you didn't understand what I understand, but this means that much to me. John 21 and verse 3 simply says this. Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. He's looking at his disciples and he's talking to his disciples here and he says, I'm going to go fish. And that's so powerful because that's so me. Right? This is that moment in my life, and I've been here so many times. My spiritual roadmap has said, you are here in that verse, John 21 and verse 3, so many times. Because I am often the most hard on myself. 
and I feel unworthy and I don't feel good enough. And in my heart, I tell myself, if only you could have done better or if only you would have said it different. If only, if only, if only. And I'm so good at looking at myself and saying, I did it wrong. I messed up. And Peter's response to his mistake was to revert back to where he came from in the beginning. And he looks to his disciples. Why did he put this verse in here? Not because you needed to know that Peter was going to go fishing. There's a lot of things that weren't recorded in Scripture where people went fishing or went out and took a hike. They don't tell us all that because we don't need to know. But this was different. Peter says, I'm going back to who I was before I was called to follow Jesus in the first place. I'm going fishing. And his disciples don't look at him and say, no, 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 stay. There's hope here. Hang in there. The other disciples who rejected him too looked at Peter and they said, we'll go with you. And all these guys, these faithful men, laid down their metaphorical cross and they distanced themselves from Jesus all the way back to the beginning. Have you ever done this before in your own life? And you said, I can't do this. I can't live up to the standard that God has set for me. I can't live up to the standard that my family has set for me. I grew up in a, in a, in a family line and in a generation who loved the Lord. My parents or grandparents or these people, my friends, man, they're all there. I just, I'm not as good as them. I can't be there. I can't live up to this. And so I, I'm going to step out. I love the Lord but I've got to distance myself from him because I'm not worthy to be around him. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. Don't you know that Peter hears the crowing of the rooster every morning? Don't you know he replays that sound in his mind over and over again? I mean, maybe in his mind he thinks, no, you know what, maybe it's not all lost. And then he hears that. (laughs) It's like, no, You're not worth, even if if Jesus was telling the truth, even if Jesus was right, he would raise from the dead. Even if that was true, he wouldn't want somebody like me. And she lives with this crowing of the rooster and some of you are sitting out here and you have heard the rooster crow as you came in here in your Sunday dress and you sat down in these church pews and you sang these songs but you're thinking about the the mistakes that you've made this past weekend. You're thinking about how you haven't been to church in over a year. You're thinking how you're just not committed. You want to pray to God but every prayer you pray starts off, God, I'm so sorry that I haven't been praying to you lately and you're just consumed with this guilt and this shame and you're following Jesus and you love him but you're following him at a distance and you're hearing the rooster crow saying you're not good enough and that's where Peter was but Jesus comes to Peter the resurrected Jesus encounters Peter and he performs the same miracle that he did at the beginning look at it in John 21 it's the same miracle Jesus shows back up by the sea And he calls out to them because they're back fishing. They've given up. But Jesus calls out and says, hey, guys, have you caught any fish? (laughs) They say, no. And he says, cast your net on the other side, just like before. And they start to catch so much, the text says, in John, not the same miracle. It's the same miracle, but it's not the same story. This is a different time doing the same thing. Their nets begin to break. And it says, the one whom Jesus loved, talking about John, it says, he looks over to Peter and he says, that's Jesus. And Peter, as Peter does, it says he wraps his waistcoat around him and then he jumps into the water. And you're like, oh, that's no big deal. He's close to shore. The text tells you he was 100 yards away, but he starts swimming to Jesus. I'm coming. And what I love is when he gets there, he doesn't find a Jesus who says, I told you so. You shouldn't have done this. He finds a Jesus who's got a campfire ready and he's already cooking some fish on the fire and he invites Peter and the rest of the disciples to the, to the fire. And it's this beautiful welcome party as they all share together. But here's the thing. Don't you know that Peter in the back of his mind, what's he hearing? Ur-ur-ur. I shouldn't be here. And there's this awkward thing where I'm excited to see you. I'm so glad that you're okay. But we have some tension here because the last thing I remember is that look that you gave me when your nose was crushed in and and you had blood coming down your face because the crown of thorns was crushing into your skull and, and, and you had two big black eyes and you were miserable and cut to shreds and you turned and you looked over at me and I went the other way. 
And so Jesus does this thing where he calls him three times, by the way, which matches perfectly with the three times that Peter denies him. Now he looks to Peter and look at John 21. It tells you three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Of course I love you. You know that I love you. And he says, then feed my sheep. Why does he do this? Because Jesus is telling him right then, it's not about who you are. It's about who I am. Jesus is telling him, it's okay. I forgive you and I love you. And some of you feel so guilty for the life that you've lived or the way that you used to follow Jesus and you were so close three years ago, but then something happened along your road and you've been following him at a distance this morning. But Jesus, just like he did to Peter, is inviting you to rededicate your life. I'm trying to tell you, you don't have to listen to the crowing of the rooster when you have a resurrected Lord who's ready to take control of your life this morning. And he's inviting you to come back to him no matter how far away you've wandered. And that's what he does for Peter. And I love it. We'll end here. I love this. In this same context, this same thing's happening. They're sitting around that fire eating and Jesus turns to Peter and he says, feed my sheep. Verse 18, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted, but when you were old, you... Da, 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 da. Verse 19, Jesus said, follow me. First thing he said to him all those years ago. And now Peter, he's going to be tempted to look down at his old navel again and say, I'm not worthy. But Jesus, he doesn't remind him of all the mistakes, not because he doesn't know them, but because he's already forgiven them. And Jesus just wants Peter to rededicate once again and say... Stop living with the crowing of the rooster and start following me again. Pick up your cross and here we go. But Jesus isn't gonna make him. He's gonna leave that decision up to Peter. And the question is, will Peter choose to accept? And spoiler alert, Peter accepts. And he's the same Peter who goes on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two and preaches the very first gospel sermon to the same people who hung Jesus to the cross and baptizes 3,000 of them. He's the same Peter who in Acts chapter three will go to a gate called Beautiful and Jesus will give him the power to heal this man who is lame and cannot walk. He's the same Peter in Acts chapter 10 who will go to the Gentiles who receives this vision from Jesus. He receives this vision from God and he will go to the Jews and say these Gentiles they belong in the kingdom too. And he will open up the gospel for the Gentiles to be preached. That same Peter who denied him three times is the same one who ends up following him so closely and then writes a couple of New Testament letters on top of it. And if God can take him, even when he followed at such a distance, and use him for that, my message is he can do that for you too. So the question you have to answer this morning is where are you? Are you close to Jesus? Have you never started following Jesus? Or have you distanced yourself from him? And wherever you're at on your journey, he's giving you an invitation to come closer than you've ever been. And he wants you to take that step right now as together we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus, standing for the right, holding up the standard in the thing he spied, missing for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, so we may reply, I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Faithful to 